Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, ASTM International Committee D37 on Cannabis, the Road to Consensus Standards, presented by Robert Morgan, the Director of Technical Committee Operations for ASTM International. I am Judy O'Rourke, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone this event is interactive and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want anytime you want during the presentation. Just click on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen, or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Robert Morgan. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you very much, Judy, and, and a big thank you to LabRoots for inviting uh, ASTM International to uh, give an update um, on our newly formed Committee D37 on Cannabis. And what I would like to do is uh, talk to you a little bit about ASTM and our process with regard to uh, standards development. So a little bit about ASTM. Uh, many of you may be familiar with our organization, which has been around for 120 years. And ASTM was established to solve a problem that occurred back in 1898 with trains derailing from the tracks across the country and some scientists and engineers got together and uh, determined that the quality of the steel used in the rails was inconsistent and therefore the trains would uh, often derail. So the first standard was created in ASTM back in 1898 for steel rails and this was the first problem solved by ASTM. Today we have uh, over 30,000 members that participate on 147 different technical committees in ASTM. And we have over uh, 12,000 standards that have been developed by these technical committees. And these 32,000 members that uh, come from all aspects of the industry. Um, ASTM is an international standards development organization. Uh, we have 8,000 members from 135 countries around the world. And as you can see, ASTM standards, quite a few of them are used in 75 countries around the world. ASTM is an accredited standards development organization uh, in the US by ANSI, in Canada by the uh, Canadian Standards Board, and as well as ASTM is an international standards development organization as we conform to the World Trade Organization's principles of consensus. And those are openness and transparency. The ASTM is one of the world's largest developer of, of international standards. Uh, just to, to let you know, ASTM standards impact our lives on a daily basis. The gasoline that you put in your car is based on an ASTM standard. The fuel that's used in airplanes around the world are based on ASTM standards. Construction materials, steel, concrete, all the way to things like children's toys and uh, the safety for the consumer in all different aspects of industry. ASTM's mission is to, de to develop standards that will improve the quality of products and services while providing protection for the consumers and the environment. So what role do ASTM standards uh, play? 
Well, as I just mentioned, the primary role is to ensure safety and quality and re reliability of products and services. Uh, ASTM provides a, a platform for innovation to uh, come into the marketplace. And the end result of the industry stakeholders that develop the standards uh, that, that's built on consensus uh, have marketplace relevance in helping everyone and improving the quality, as mentioned. And as, as stakeholders, that is a term that we use for the people that are on our technical committees. And they come from industry, they come from government, they come from academia, and they all take an active role in shaping the content of these standards. So as I mentioned, ASTM has been around for 120 years, and what we do at ASTM, in ASTM staff, which I am a member of, is we provide the infrastructure and tools for industry stakeholders to collaborate on topics and shape the content of standards. We also provide support for um, online collaboration areas, uh, meetings support, administrative support, editorial support, in trying to minimize those tasks for our members so our members can focus on the technical content of the standards. So it's an opportunity for us to bring together the expertise and knowledge from industry and participate in a transparent open process to anyone that is interested. ASTM staff does not write the standards. We don't take any kind of a role or advocacy with regard to the content of standards. We just provide the framework and infrastructure to develop and deliver those standards. So it's all about the power of partnership in ASTM, bringing uh, the people that make products, people that buy the products, and people that consume the products are all involved in shaping the content. There's a, a neutral forum that is a web-based forum for development. Uh, people can work on their standards 24-7. And we have consensus-based procedures that protect the people that participate in our standards development process. And it also creates a great partnership uh, between the private and public sector with regard to the use of standards. And we'll, we'll touch upon that in a little bit. But in ASTM, everyone has an equal say in the development of the standard. A large company like ExxonMobil has the same power as an individual that has an interest in a particular topic. ASTM has a fair platform, so everyone has an equal say and a particular interest group cannot dominate uh, and shape and shape the content for their advantage. So another aspect of ASTM is we require a balance of interest to participate uh, for a committee to be uh, actively participating in developing standards. Uh, the primary concept of balance in ASTM is the, the producers of the products and services that is being covered by the technical committee cannot have more than 50% of the votes when you collectively look at the whole technical committee. The users and consumers and general interests can have more than 50% of the votes in our process, but balance is maintained by minimizing the role of the producers to be not more than 50%. So this is a typical technical committee structure in ASTM. As I mentioned, we have 147, and it could be 148 today, main committees in ASTM. And as I mentioned, everything from steel, petroleum, textiles, sports equi equipment, toy safety, consumer products, uh, these are topics of ASTM main committees. And then underneath the main committee umbrella are subcommittees that are broken down into more specific subject matter. And then underneath the subcommittees in ASTM, we have 
task groups. And task groups are typically smaller groups of individuals that have a desire to begin the initial drafting of standards. So this is the typical structure of an ASTM committee and consensus is achieved by working your way up through this process from the task group through the subcommittee and ultimately through the main committee. So oftentimes we get asked how long does it take to develop a, a voluntary consensus standard? And it, it really depends on a lot of variables. You know, how complex is the subject being addressed? How urgent is the need? Is this a safety concern that needs to be addressed right away? When those uh, aspects are known, then that kind of equates to the time that the volunteer members on our technical committees are able to devote to the project. So uh, we've, we've invested a lot of resources over the years in our standards development platform that has greatly assisted the timeline. And standards uh, can get through our process and approved in, in as short as seven months. And some complex uh, standard activities might be a year and a half to get through the process that gets consensus where uh, the majority of the people are on board with the standard to allow it to get approved. So what do standards do in industry and what role do they play in regulations? This is a question that's asked a lot. And ASTM standards, it's important to note that ASTM standards are developed voluntar voluntarily by the members on our technical committees, and they're used voluntarily in the marketplace. Now, oftentimes an ASTM standard is cited in a contract, and then of course that would make it mandatory and it would need to be followed. It's also interesting that uh, the federal government back in 1995 passed the National Technology Transfer Act, Public Law 104-113, which directs government agencies to rely on voluntary standards developed by industry stakeholders to use to support regulation and laws by the federal government. So literally thousands of ASTM standards are used in um, a variety of levels of, of government, whether that's the federal level, the state level, or municipal level, and countries around the world rely on ASTM standards in support of their regulations and laws. So some of our programs and services that we provide. Uh, initially, ASTM was uh, primarily focused on standards development solutions were developed through standards. And when a technical committee is created, uh, oftentimes they, they go through an exercise pre-standardization where they will host symposia or technical workshops to have information presented to the committees to help create ideas for developing the standards. Uh, once the standard gets through the process, achieves consensus, ASTM has additional services and programs to support the standards. We have product certification. We have uh, interlaboratory study programs that help in the development of standard test methods. ASTM will assist in put, putting together that interlaboratory study, distribute samples, and help create a standard that is reliable and will have a precision and bias statement along with it to say how accurate the standard uh, is doing what it says it's doing. In addition to that, we have a laboratory proficiency testing program where people are able to share lab results and able to compare their, their results with others performing the same test. So uh, you are able to see how your laboratory is performing. We have a training program that supports uh, various standards development activities. Um, some of these, stand, uh, some of these uh, training programs uh, are certificate programs and can result in personnel certification. And ASTM's uh, latest platform for the delivery of our technical information uh, is referred to as COMPASS. 
And this enables us to deliver our standards to companies and organizations and provide access company-wide through our Compass platform. Uh, ASTM also uh, is involved with partnerships. A lot of our partnerships are formal, uh, informational. We may co-brand our standard with another organization that has expertise in a specific topic. And we work to uh, develop partnerships by collecting data and sharing databases and creating centers of excellence. Uh, where innovation is able to be discussed. But the most important partnership, I think, that exists in ASTM is the partnership that, ex that exists between the members and the work that they're doing in the committee. Uh, they're able to, to uh, meet a lot of people that are involved in the same activities that they are, and they're able to exchange ideas, and those ideas often find their way in the form of standards and improving the quality and the safety of products. So that was a, a brief um, overview of ASTM in general. And, and what I'd like to do now is tell you about one of our latest technical committees that was formed, and that is Committee D37 on cannabis. So ASTM, took about 18 months to, to do research and due diligence to review the landscape of the cannabis industry to determine if, in fact, this was a space that could benefit from standards. And during that 18-month process, uh, we met with a variety of stakeholders, and we uh, wanted to solicit their input and identify gaps to see if an organization like ASTM uh, would be beneficial to the industry. And as a result of that 18 month exploration, uh, last year at ASTM headquarters, uh, back in February, we had a group of about 65 people representing uh, the stakeholder community, as you see described there on the slide, um, and they voted unanimously to form Committee D37. So as a result of this organizational meeting, they approved the scope, and the scope is, is quite simple and broad. It's the development and maintenance of standards and guidance materials for cannabis and its products and services. And they broke this uh, topic D37 on cannabis down to um, the subcommittees that you see listed there. So these subcommittees, it, it's important to note, is we have representation by um, the people that cultivate cannabis, the, the people that supply cannabis, the people that uh, from the states that are involved in regulating cannabis transportation and security people are involved in our activity, as well as software developers and accreditation bodies and, labor and laboratories, and of course, researchers from academia. These are all um, the stakeholder entities that are represented in Committee D37. This slide right now uh, shows um, 280 members, and uh, it's, it's a little dated. Currently, we have over 350 members representing the stakeholder community that you see on the slide here. And <clears throat> as I mentioned uh, about the format of our committee structure, a lot of the work takes place more specifically within the subcommittees, and you can see the way the group voted to break down the activity of ca cannabis. We have subcommittees on horticulture and agriculture, quality and ma quality management systems, laboratory practices, processing and handling, security and transportation, personnel training, assessment and credentialing, as well as terminology. The executive committee is uh, consists of the officers, the elected officers of the committee which also come from the stakeholder community. So 
So in the process of, of forming the committee and um, continuing at their first meeting that was held last June in Toronto, Canada, the topical areas that were uh, discussed as a need where standards could fill are described on this slide and you can see it's, it's quite a busy slide here and I, I certainly um, won't, won't read all these topics, but as you can see, um, it's a very thorough list of activities that have been identified by the stakeholders that standards could have an impact in creating legitimacy for this industry. And that's the one thing that I have noticed as I have inter interacted with the variety of stakeholders in this industry is uh, they're, they're serious scientists and, and businessmen and, and regulators, and they recognize that um, this industry has a need for legitimacy and they see that being reached through the formation of standards and, and the marketplace use of standards. And, and that makes me uh, wanna mention that one of the reasons ASTM has been successful for 120 years is the idea of getting the right stakeholders involved in the committee, having the right people at the table making decisions on technical content will result on what we refer to as a marketplace relevant standard. It will have utility in the marketplace and the industry will be willing to use these standards as a way to improve the quality of products and services and uh, taking into consideration safety for the consumer as well as safety to the environment. Um, th this is an important aspect of ASTM and Committee D37 on cannabis seems to be well positioned with a, with a great collection of stakeholders um, that will be shaping the content of standards. And we're continuing to grow and we're hoping that um, the folks that are listening to this particular presentation may have an interest in participating and help shaping the content of these standards for this industry. So I just would, would like to show some of the activities that are currently being pursued by the various subcommittees. The subcommittee on cultivation and agriculture uh, is working on a standard practice for the cultivation of medical grade cannabis. They're also working on a way to classify the various horticultural stages of cannabis. Um, the next subcommittee, D3702 on laboratory, is focused on laboratory practices that will be used uh, to make sure that um, things like corrective action and preventative action are in place uh, in the laboratory. Uh, as they deal with cultivation, processing, and testing and distribution of, of the materials. So quality management systems um, will be addressed in, in the subcommittee on laboratory. Working with the laboratory subcommittee, D3703 on quality management systems is focused on some specific topics like developing a standard test method for rapid analysis of E. coli in cannabis products and uh, various quality assurance and quality control measures that need to be um, in play in the development of analytical methods for laboratories. Subcommittee D3704 on processing handling seems to have uh, the, the largest amount of momentum at this time addressing activities of how cannabis products should be packaged and how they should be labeled so the consumer can see precisely what they are acquiring when they uh, purchase cannabis. Um, they're addressing activities like the role that water activity plays in cannabis and, and the importance of that with regard to mold formation and, and any other kind of toxins that can get into uh, the plant. They're developing standards uh, for extraction equipment and uh, methods for solvent-based uh, extraction. 
<clears throat> they're also um, looking for techniques for the refinement of cannabis extracts and coming up with um, percents of uh, the various uh, constituents that are found in cannabis and making sure that that information is included on the labeling and packaging of cannabis materials. Uh, an interesting activity that was uh, identified, I found it interesting, had to do with uh, developing uh, a standard on the functionality of pressurized meter dosed inhalers, which many of you may be familiar with um, if you dealt with asthma or if your children have, are dealing with asthma or other lung issues. Um, the idea is to make sure that these um, devices are uh, developed in a, in a safe way and that the components do not bring in any kind of toxins into uh, the delivery of the product. <clears throat> Next uh, subcommittee is on security and transportation and uh, the, the regulatory community seems to be interested in, in these uh, particular topics and uh, a standard practice for putting a video, surve video surveillance system uh, is, is entering into the ballot process right now. There's also standard practice being developed for access control systems and also intrusion detect, uh, detection systems. All of these are important for the industry as they move forward and uh, evolve into uh, a more legitimate industry. We have subcommittee D3706 on personnel training, assessment, and credentialing. And right now they are focused on working on a standard practice for a certificate program for the cannabis industry. And this will be around um, people that work in laboratories and <clears throat> the qualifications that they'll need to have to be considered um, uh, a qualified participant in, in a cannabis activity. So <clears throat> that concludes my presentation on uh, ASTM committee D37 on cannabis. Um, I hope that I've uh, generated some interest from the community and um, we'd certainly be interested in hearing your questions and uh, hopefully we'll have good responses to them, but hopefully we'll uh, stimulate your interest and have you get involved in ASTM and help shape this content. So my contact information is here. Um, ASTM, as mentioned, is a international organization. We have offices in Canada, Belgium, Peru, and China. And it's interesting to note that um, this cannabis in industry is truly a global industry. We had a well workshop in Berlin last October that was well attended, had uh, multiple countries represented, and they are uh, excited to help participate and shape the content in global standards that will improve the quality and products and services for this industry. I thank you very much for your time and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Robert, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. So if you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, how are ASTM standards used in the marketplace? Okay, well, a ASTM standards, as I, as I mentioned, uh, are used on a daily basis in the marketplace. Uh, all products that you can just about think of that are in your home, that your home is made of, um, the fuel for your car and airplanes, um, children's toys, they all come into play in making sure that 
the quality of these products and services are at the highest they can be while also being safe for use. So these standards are developed by volunteer members on the technical committees, and then they're used voluntarily by the marketplace. And the good news, as I mentioned, if you have the right people at the table um, making the decisions, you'll have a marketplace relevant document that will have desire to be used. Also, they uh, find their way into government regulations, as I stated, and thousands of ASTM standards are used to assist in help shaping the content of regulations, again, for keeping a safe environment or protecting the consumer in one way or another. So ASTM standards are used daily in the marketplace by, by companies around the world. Thank you for that, Robert. How are ASTM standards different from government regulations? Well, government regulations are, are mandatory documents. They're law and, and they have to be followed. ASTM standards, uh, again, are uh, developed by volunteers on our committees. And when they get into the marketplace, they do not necessarily have to be followed if they're not part of some kind of mandate in a contract or by a regulation. It's up to the marketplace to determine whether they want to use the standard or not. And as I mentioned, the good news is because of the people and the commitment of the volunteers and the stakeholders, the end result are standards that have utility and the marketplace is driven to use them because of the impact they have on the products and services that are in play with regard to the standards. I would like to once again thank Robert Morgan for his presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through June 29, 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That is all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye.